For some strange reason, music has gone from cavemen rhythmically bashing sticks against rocks for fun to becoming one of the key cornerstones of our society when it comes to art. Music is so widespread, from white-faced edgelords making black metal, to individuals who like money a little bit too much, making the most vanilla and inoffensive pop music known to man. It's inevitable that some of the most insane individuals end up making careers out of music, and surprisingly, it's more common than you would think. For some reason, the sound of blaring guitars mixed with pulsating kick drums makes people do some of the most outlandish things on stage. The first band that comes to mind, the band that decided to combine rhythmic shotgun shells, glitter and a lot of fire in their live performances, a band with a discography that spans so many genres and oftentimes leaves listeners extremely confused with a blaring headache, a band that took anarchic performance art to new highs or lows depending on how you look at it. This band is the Butthole Surfers. Butthole Surfers would form in the late 70s, originally composed of Gibby Haynes and Paul Leary, who would meet at university becoming close friends after discovering they both hated mainstream music as much as each other. You may be thinking, university? That doesn't sound degenerate enough, just you wait. Gibby would graduate university and secure a job as an accountant, the formation of butthole surfers would also occur around this time. The band would begin practicing regularly, Gibby would get off work late, stumble through the door for practice, immediately start stripping down to his underwear whilst wailing and screeching. This would continue until the police inevitably came and switched off the power. Butthole surfers wasn't actually their original name. They tried a few other options that I 100% cannot repeat on YouTube, but you can find it on Google. Music wouldn't be their only collaborative project however. The two would publish a magazine named Strange VD Magazine, which consisted of abnormal medical ailments coupled with fake, albeit humorous explanations for each image. This magazine eventually got into the hands of Gibby's employers, which I can only imagine resulted in an extremely awkward business meeting. Around the time Leary would drop out of college one semester shy of his degree, Gibby and Leary were now both unemployed, Nietzsche you might say. The duo would resort to the only reasonable thing to do in this situation, sell homemade clothes with images of Lee Harvey Oswald on the front. Surprisingly this didn't take off in the way they thought, and they shifted their entire focus to the surfers. Just before we continue, the surfers typically always had four to five members. I'm not going to mention specific lineup changes, because because for some reason, not many people actually wanted to stay in the surface for very long, which resulted in a schizophrenic list of lineup changes. I wonder why. The band would play essentially wherever they were allowed to play. They would move from city to city depending on whether the crowd liked them or not, and the crowd had plenty to dislike. The live shenanigans the surface are known for had truly started. These antics included, but were not limited to, smashing sugar bottles over each other's heads to convince the audience they had just witnessed an assault, filling a foam tube with urine in order to spray all over the crowd, and throwing handfuls of photocopied cockroach images into the crowd. Although these visuals were important to their overstimulating, sensory overloading concerts, they weren't actually required to achieve said overstimulation. Somehow the music was enough. Gibby would sing his vocals through either toilet roll or a megaphone, depending on how he was feeling that day, that was linked to a range of equipment and pedals, allowing him to distort, mutate, and live loop his vocals. This was named the Gibbytronics. These vocals were accompanied by distorted screaming guitars, two drummers playing standing kits, and, um, and this sometimes. This kind of behaviour summed up the surfer's early career with all five members living out of their tour van, weaseling their way into any lineup they could. They'd also collect glass bottles for five cents a piece, using that money for their next hot meal, also opting to spend that money on other things that I can't talk about on YouTube. All I can say is it certainly suppressed their appetite, so I don't know if they needed that much food. They also had a pit bull because of course they did. Luckily or unluckily, depending on how you look at it, Dead Kennedy's frontman Jello Biafra would witness one of these concerts, inviting the surfers to open for the Kennedys, later offering to pay for the recording of their first album. The surfers' self-titled EP would be released released in 1983, featuring some pretty wacky noises alongside a humorous album cover designed by the Surfers themselves. This album would actually go on to influence this mother <laughs> who listed this EP and the Surfers as a whole as one of his main influences. Kurt would actually meet Courtney Love at a Surfers show, which honestly explains a lot. Financial issues would plague the band around this time, resulting in their second project essentially just being live performances and previously released songs. Luckily, their live shows were continuing to grow as word spread of the many, let's say, situations that occurred at their live shows. Some examples include touching their private parts against a briefcase later used by former President Jimmy Carter, playing footage of surgeries in the background, repeatedly cross-dressing on stage, filling an inverted symbol with lighter fluid and setting it on fire before smashing it with a mallet, as well as tearing stuffed animals apart. And that's just the stuff I'm allowed to talk about on YouTube, trust me, it gets a lot worse. One of their particularly infamous shows would be an all-ages show in 1987. The band members would immediately strip in front of the all ages crowd, which surprisingly didn't result in the cancellation. It would be Haynes literally setting himself on fire that led the owner of the venue to pull the plug. The band wasn't happy with this, however, and created a makeshift flamethrower out of a lighter and rubbing alcohol to fend off the bouncers. The live shows seemed to be the main talking point and appeal of the surfers at the time, as many of the albums were going unnoticed in the mainstream. Regardless of this, they would continue to travel from city to city, trying their best to scrounge for any studio time. After a particularly depraved tour, they would actually end up in Athens, Georgia, 
This doesn't seem too noteworthy until it's revealed that they will actually go to Athens specifically to stalk members of REM. They were so dead set on this plan that they actually set up a scuffed recording studio in Athens and they literally only decided on this location so they could stalk another band. You actually can't make this up. The surfers would go on to record what is considered by many to be their best project within the studio. Locust the Technician was released in 1987 and was the heaviest project to date, melding aspects of punk, heavy metal and psychedelia with a range of unique sounds and a slower grinding pace. This album is seen as a precursor to grunge by many individuals. They were obviously very proud of this project, as around the time of the release they would move back to Texas and finally decide to use modern recording studios, which resulted in the production and release of these projects. As the 80s came to a close, there was a familiar clout goggle, cardigan wearing creature dominating pop culture. The release of Nevermind by Nirvana in 1991 really changed the way in which major labels were looking for artists to sign. Everyone wanted a new Nirvana, and despite the surfers probably being one of the most degenerate and risky bands of all time, they received heavy praise and backing from Cobain himself. This resulted in something nobody saw coming. The surfers were signed to Capitol Records. Yep, the same label that signed ABBA and the Beatles had decided to sign whatever the <laughs> this is. They would pair the surfers with producer John Paul Jones, best known as the bassist for Led Zeppelin. They would attempt to morph this into something that would appeal to a mainstream audience. Believe it or not, it would actually work. As a result of this collaboration, Independent Worm Saloon would feature a more straightforward approach to their previously explored noise, which actually led to the surfers achieving their first minor radio hit in the form of the song Who Was In My Room Last Night. In the coming years, the band would remain relatively normal, apart from, of course, a lot of lineup changes and live shows that still contained a lot of naked flames, although were a far cry from the weirdness of their shows in the 80s. The band would enter the sellout arc of their musical journey, as the previous degenerate lifestyle would be replaced by multiple lawsuits from the band to previous labels as well as full funding from Capital. This would lead to the band becoming semi-mainstream for a few years, with the release of the album Electric Larry Land, specifically the song Pepper, which would top the US rock charts. Although sales were increasing, the relationship with Capital was beginning to fade. This combined with the punk community distancing themselves from the surfers due to the lawsuit and what was perceived as selling out. All this led to Electric Larry Land being the last full-length project that's worth noting. They would continue to sell out in the coming years, releasing this abomination, which was strange in comparison to most music, but lacked the same edge the surfers had during their 20 year career previously. Many attribute much of the surfers' legacy to their reputation on stage, but I think that's doing them a disservice. Alongside bands like Big Black and Scratch Acid, the surfers had a fusion of noise and punk that would be the main catalyst for grunge. The band had a sense of humour and non-conformity that hadn't been seen to that level before. This fact remains surprising considering they reached the top of the music world, from homeless degenerates to major label members to sellouts. Seems like a natural progression to me.